Greetings and welcome to Roundtable 2 on the Biobased Future and Biorefining. My name is Jim Spath and I work for the U.S. Department of Energy. It's my pleasure to be hosting this session. I have four guests rep representing a wide range of the industry and I'd like to introduce them here. First is Paolo Corvo. He's the Global Key Account Manager for Business Lines, Biofuels and Derivatives at Clarient. Next is Sarah Gallo. She's the Acting Senior Advisor for Agriculture and Environmental Policy at BIO. Next we have Jorge Soto. He's the Sustainable Development Director at Braskem. And finally, Professor Luke van der Weyland. He's the Director of the Bernal Institute and Bernal Professor for Biosystems Engineering and Design at the University of Limerick, Ireland. This is a topic full of many challenges and opportunities, and I very much look forward to the presentations and the dialogue. So without ado, I will start the session with Paulo. Thanks everybody for the interest and time you're dedicating to the session. A warm good morning or good afternoon and welcome from my side. I will be focusing on our advanced technology solution called Sun Liquid, including a deeper dive on technical details and commercial readiness. But the core part will be on our commercial plant being built in Romania. I work for Clariant, which is one of the world's leading specialty chemical companies. Uh, we're Swiss based, 3.8 billion Swiss francs sales 2020, more than 13,000 employees. We're present worldwide with uh, 85 production sites. You can see here our three business areas, care chemicals, natural resources and catalysis. In all these areas, innovation, R&D, sustainability are playing a key role. Finally, the business line where I work for, which is biofuels and derivatives, which focuses on our lignocellulosic ethanol solution called Sun Liquid. I presented a similar slide uh, as well last year, uh, and I'm not tired to highlight again the importance of uh, decarbonizing the transport sector. Uh, the latter is one of the key sectors uh, uh, that, if tackled, will enable us to really make a difference in the global climate targets. Climate change is one of the global challenges of this century, as needless to say, the transport sector is responsible for circa 25% of greenhouse gas saving emissions worldwide and consumes almost 50% of the world's oil production. And this creates a growing demand for technological advancements in this field. Transport is certainly a substantial contributor to the emissions and global warming. So we need to do something about this and there are different solutions, but we believe that the most important driver as a solution um, are advanced biofuels, which are playing a key role in decarbonizing the transportation sector. Uh, we've been developing the sun liquid technology to convert egg residues and waste streams into cellulosic ethanol. Um, and this is available now and can be used as it is for further process to be utilized in different modes of transportation from gasoline blending to also marine shipping and aviation. So let's see more about this. Sun liquid is ready to be utilized. It's not only ethanol production or carbon neutral or even carbon negative biofuel production, but it's also a platform that provides sugars. And these sugars can be converted via biotechnology or catalytic conversion routes to other biochemical intermediates. And the same way goes for ethanol too. Let me walk you through four simple steps. First one is pure mechanical and thermal pretreatment of the residues or waste streams or even added energy crops. This saves cost and increases safety because it's completely chemical free. The second one uh, in which we have enzymes which are fully process integrated and tailor made to the process feedstock, increasing the performance uh, on one side, but also lowering cost on the other side. Uh, once these enzyme, enzymes um, break down the fibers and release both C5 and C6 sugars, uh, which are mixed to the solid part lignin, then we have a solid liquid filter press which separates um, the solid from the liquid part, uh, the solid uh, byproduct lignin, which is 60% dry, can be used as energy source to provide electricity and steam requirements to the processor. The third step is the fermentation, uh, so that C5 and C6 sugars, uh, mixed sugars, uh, are fermented into ethanol in one part reaction. And this is done by optimized microorganisms or yeasts. There are also feedstock specific, and produced integrated in the system. In addition to this, we can recycle up to 20 times the yeast. 
And here we have the second side product, which is CO2, which uh, is um, high purity and can be captured and utilized. And if we capture it and utilize it, then the entire system can reach up to 120% greenhouse gas saving. I'll have more about that later. So extremely high and carbon negative. Fourth and last, uh, ethanol is then purified to 99.8%, going through a beer column, rectification, and finally a dehydration unit. And in this fourth step, we also have the production of Vinasso, the other side product. Um, so both uh, byproducts, uh, lignin and Vinasso, have a uh, roughly a 60% dry uh, matter. Very good quality, thanks to as well uh, to the chemical uh, uh, free pretreatment. Vinasso can be utilized as a biofertilizer back in the field or biogas source or as an energy feedstock. As I said, 95% greenhouse gas saving uh, um, of uh, 2G ethanol is uh, what we deliver with Sun Liquid. And this really means um, circa 120,000 tons of CO2 um, avoided uh, or uh, 35,000 uh, cars uh, um, avoided uh, that would be emitting such a volume of, of CO2. Let's bring in some news. So liquid process can convert a broad range of feedstock and for these we're delivering process guarantees to our customers. And this has been enabled thanks to the fact that we have been running performance runs um, in our pre-commercial site plant in uh, Straubing, Germany, together with the process conditions uh, uh, and feedstock specific biocatalysts that we have been developing. Well, you, most of you know that uh, we have a, a wide experience on, on wheat straw, on corn stover, uh, rice straw, sugarcane um, uh, bagasse, and other energy crops. Uh, but I want to highlight the inclusion now of forestry residues, uh, empty fruit bunches, uh, and midribs, for which we have uh, brought in another positive step forward in broadening our feedstock uh, processing capabilities and offering, uh, which are now available, um, including process guarantees. In addition to these, we have uh, an overall more than 30 uh, additional residues uh, being tested in labs and pilot scale. The feedstock I've been discussing in the previous slide have been all duly tested uh, uh, in our pre-commercial site plant uh, here. So we have a um, we were able to have reliable, stable, and continued operations for more than eight years. This facility is a 1,000 tons of ethanol per annum, processing circa 4,400 tons of dry feedstock. Um, we are using this facility uh, also as a training uh, uh, facility for our customers. They bring their own feedstock, uh, they tested it, and based on this, we provide process guarantees in our license conditions and terms. And this is our 50,000 tons cellulosic ethanol plant, um, requiring roughly 250,000 tons uh, of straw locally sourced, mainly uh, wheat and barley. And it will be completed in uh, this year, 2021, in the southwestern part of Romania, in the town of Podari. This will be a cornerstone of our continuing transformation into a a leading specialty chemical company and another important uh, proof point of our commitment to innovation and sustainability. Uh, the plant is currently under construction and also despite COVID situation, uh, the work has been continued um, with all the pandemic uh, precautions regulations established by the Romanian uh, authority, authorities. And in the past months, several milestones have been reached uh, on the construction uh, site and also the majority of the large key equipment has already been installed. Um, we uh, also uh, have been uh, off-taking uh, the full production in the multi-year agreement. Uh, we are completing the construction of uh, a greenfield power plant, uh, which will process uh, lignin uh, to produce the energy uh, requirements, uh, including Vinas as a biofertilizer, and this plant will be our uh, footprint and will act as a training facility for our customers. For the ones of you that uh, uh, were here last year, uh, you can certainly see uh, the impressive progress. Um, this is um, clearly visible in, in what's already been uh, installed. Uh, so you can uh, basically 
quickly follow the the feedstock uh, uh, processing from the from the straw storage to the straw milling enzyme fermentation uh, the hydrolysis vessel and filter press building uh, to the power plant chp plant uh, and finally to the ethanol fermenters distillation area and finally ethanol storage maybe it, some additional key numbers this is based on a 10 hectare uh, site there's 22 processing units 40 kilometers of piping 2700 instruments more than 4000 tons of steel uh, 50,000 metric cube of concrete, and 20, 220 kilometers of, of cable, and uh, roughly 800 people have been working on the site. So allow me now to invite you over for an aerial view of our plant in Podari. This footage has been taken uh, just some days ago. And now a short safety moment. We are, I'm, I'm proud to announce that we have been reaching a, a 1 million hours without any lost time accident throughout the construction of our plant. And this has been uh, uh, reachable thanks to the rigorous safety policy that uh, we have been um, utilizing uh, throughout this construction time uh, by our project uh, team. And finally, let me update you on the Sun Liquid licenses being sold. We have sold five licenses until now, three in Europe and two in China. What is important is that this enabled us to create knowledge on different setups. On the left, you see, for instance, uh, um, the experience that we gained by uh, integrated a second generation to an existing first generation ethanol plant with the first license sold uh, to um, Enviral in Slovakia or the second license uh, sold to uh, Orlen Poludnie in Poland, uh, integrated into an existing refinery, or embracing the interest of an agricultural company um, in the project Etabio uh, on the third license sold in Europe in Bulgaria. And then finally on the right, uh, you see the two licenses sold in uh, China, the first one to um, the, in the Greenfield site in uh, Fujian city, between uh, in, in the joint venture of Guajen and Chemtex, and uh, the last one sold uh, to Sinodan uh, in uh, uh, northeast uh, China in the Heilongjiang province. Sun liquid is not only the production of ethanol for transportation use, but it's uh, what we call a platform, as I said in the beginning. So it's an ideal platform for highly sustainable bio based products. We we'll basically use the same biomass as feedstock source. To be converted into uh, C5 C6 sugars, uh, providing customers uh, with uh, flexibility to utilize these sugars for downstream conversion to other downstream products and byproducts. And examples can be, for instance, uh, cellulosic biodiesel, such as the Clan and Exogenomatic Collaboration, or organic acids, uh, fatty acids, or even hydrocarbons with the collaboration that uh, we have with uh, Global Bioenergy, or even conversion of ethanol to ethylene to ethylene oxide thanks to the JV that we have with Sabic uh, into the US-based company Scientific Design. So this platform flexibility uh, opens up the different application fields, uh, not only in the biofuels market, including aviation and maritime fuels, for instance, but also in the automotive, uh, cosmetics, uh, lubricants and plastics. And last but not least, our extensive knowledge in biocatalysis, uh, strain development and optimization which is allowing us to adapt or adjust the quality specifications to customers' needs. We see that there's an important global climate effort needed to, to reach our uh, decarbonization objective in the transportation. And we cannot allow ourselves to fail, uh, which means that a significant increase in sustainable energy solutions must be achieved. Uh, there are different solutions, but we strongly believe that in order to 
decarbonize uh, transportation now, uh, we need to use cellulosic ethanol, uh, which can be carbon negative, and an immediate key solution with important benefits and immediate impact on the environment. Uh, certainly, the legislation, the technology that has been developed uh, and in use by Clarent for more than eight years, uh, the commercial plant construction on the way in Romania, the, the, the five licenses sold, uh, are all elements that do create an important opportunity in the current market conditions, especially for the early entrants. Thanks. Hello, my name is Sarah Gallo, and I currently serve as Acting Senior Advisor for Agriculture and Environment Policy at the Biotechnology Innovation Organization. Bio represents 1,000 member companies in a biotech ecosystem with a central mission to advance public policy that supports a wide range of companies and academic research centers that are working to apply biology and technology in the energy, agriculture, manufacturing, and health sectors to improve the lives of people and the health of the planet. Bio is committed to speaking up for the millions of families around the globe who depend on our success. We will drive a revolution that aims to cure patients, protect our climate, and nourish humanity. I appreciate the opportunity to join my fellow panelists in a discussion about the bioeconomy and how we can shape a bio-based future. As countries around the world contemplate economic revival and resiliency in the context of the pandemic, the adoption of advanced biotechnology solutions will be paramount. Collectively, we understand what it will take to get us there. Streamlined and expedited regulatory pathways for breakthrough technology solutions, expanded support for scale up of biorefineries and other bio based manufacturing, recognition of the environmental benefits of utilizing renewable chemicals throughout the manufacturing process, requirements to purchase bio based products, and more immediately, the utilization of bio based products to meet demand for personal protection equipment sterilizing and cleaning equipment, and cleaning products. Second only to the pandemic, the climate crisis provides another lens through which we contemplate biotechnology's role in tackling a global challenge. The Biotech Solutions for Climate Report, a study recently released by my organization, shows that biotechnology can achieve at least 3 billion tons of CO2 equivalent mitigation annually by 2030 using existing technologies and emerging biotechnologies could have transformative greenhouse gas benefits in a range of industrial sectors, going beyond the production of biofuels for transportation to include biochemicals, bioplastics, and other bio-based materials. Policies supporting the development and deployment of bio-based industries should be part of any government effort to address climate change. Today, I will highlight how biotechnology has the potential to be a transformative asset in the transition to a sustainable, low-carbon economy, offering vital contributions to near-term greenhouse gas reduction and revolutionary tools to avert catastrophic climate change in the longer term. Let's start with the production of sustainable biomass feedstocks. Substituting sustainably produced biomass feedstocks for fossil feedstocks is a critical component of decarbonizing the economy because it leverages the capacity of photosynthesis to remove carbon from the atmosphere. Biomass substitution has provided vital near-term reduction in the carbon intensity of transportation fuels and a rapidly growing array of consumer products. In several key markets, such as aviation fuels, bio-based alternatives offer the only viable path to GHG reductions. Now let's talk about empowering sustainable production. Biomanufacturing, the use of enzymes and microorganisms in manufacturing, can reduce greenhouse gas emissions 80% or more relative to traditional chemical routes for a variety of chemical and consumer products. In many cases, biology allows drop-in replacements of existing building blocks enabling faster adoption throughout our economy with homegrown solutions. New biotech tools, including gene editing and synthetic biology, 
offer the potential for transformative climate solutions in key emerging industry sectors. Biotech offers a sustainable model for manufacturing in the 21st century. The manufacturing of consumer products like apparel, plastics, packaging, carpet, and cosmetics is a major greenhouse gas emitter responsible for 22% of total greenhouse gas emissions. Biotechnology can dramatically reduce these emissions by making their building blocks from renewable feedstocks rather than fossil fuels. Speaking of consumer products, as awareness of the climate crisis expands, consumers are increasingly demanding lower ca carbon options and more sustainable replacements for existing products. This means finding low emission alternatives that provide the same level of performance, durability, and cost effectiveness as mature fossil-based systems. Biotechnology allows for the production of low carbon consumer products through the substitution of biomass or other recycled carbon feedstocks and by enabling more efficient biologically based production. This satisfies an increasingly important market segment while reducing emissions. Bio-based products produced from biomass or biologically recycled waste gases added $459 billion to the US economy in 2016 and are built from carbon that otherwise would have resided in the atmosphere, creating a pivotal pathway for atmosphere carbon removal. Bio-based plastics and polymers, such as PLA, PHA, and BDO, have achieved life cycle greenhouse gas reductions of up to 80% versus their petroleum-based counterparts. A rapidly growing list of new bio-based chemical building blocks is now in development. I'll spotlight two biomember companies leading the way. Genomatica has developed bio-based plastic polymers for use in apparel, footwear, electronics, and automotive products from the primary alcohol BDO, which utilizes sugars from renewable crops such as corn and sugarcane in place of fossil fuels. In addition to displacing fossil fuels, Genomatica's trademarked pathway also avoids the use of the toxic compound formaldehyde resulting in a safer process to produce BDO than the conventional fossil pathway. The pathway has been licensed to major chemical producers to produce renewable bioplastics. Another company is Danimer Scientific. Bio-based PHA is the company's primary bioplastics product. The company manufactures the medium chain polyester at a commercial facility in Winchester, Kentucky by feeding a bacterium with inexpensive vegetable oil feedstock derived from agricultural oilseed crops. Danimer Scientific's bio-based PHA possesses performance parameters that are comparable to those of many fossil fuel plastics and are capable of use in many of the same applications, including food preservation and storage and conversion to multiple types of finished resins. Unlike fossil plastics, however, PHA utilizes only renewable feedstocks and is biodegradable. This latter characteristic is important advantage over fossil plastics at a time of growing concern over landfilling and the widespread presence of non-biodegradable plastics in many ecosystems. The company has recently announced a partnership with candy maker Mars Wrigley to manufacture biodegradable packaging for food sold in stores. From just these two examples, it's clear, this is biotechnology's moment. But to seize it, we need effective collaboration with policymakers and specifically policies that accelerate the bioeconomy. Here's a spotlight about Genomatica. We additionally highlight Danimer Scientific. So how so we know how to build a bio-based future. Let's talk a little bit about who needs to help us get there. I'll speak to efforts in the United States specifically as many of my colleagues will touch on other efforts internationally. The beginning of the Biden administration marked a definite shift in how the US government would approach climate, sustainability, and the bioeconomy. Numerous proposals presented to Congress and the American public specifically identify biorefinery projects and manufacturing as eligible for financial support. Bio continues to lead efforts to ensure renewable chemicals and bio-based manufacturing qualify under a variety of programs, including those administered by the Department of Agriculture. The administration's plan to build next-generation industries in distressed communities 
highlights a market-based shift towards clean energy and support for development of specific projects. Several provisions include clean energy support in rural America. The plan also calls for funding development of regional innovation hubs, which would leverage private investment to fuel technology development and new regional business opportunities and foster urban rural connections. BIO looks forward to working with members of the administration and the United States Congress to deliver policy and regulations that help science seize the moment. We are seeing promising efforts at the state level as well, whether it is adoption of low carbon fuel standards, incentives for renewable chemical production, or economic development plans centered on bio manufacturing. Momentum at the state level is so important and we stand ready to continue these success stories. I spend a lot of time talking about transforming the food system and the fuel system, but finally today, I'd like to shift gears and spend a few minutes talking about the beauty and fashion industries. There are important lessons to be learned and tremendously exciting innovations occurring in these sectors, and both offer insights into the bio-based future and breakthroughs in how we consume bio-based products every day. Beauty and fashion have dominated and defined our cultures and traditions. However, the out with the old and in with the new practice of producing new styles multiple times a year has branded the fashion industry with its own label, Wasteful. Bio CEO, Dr. Michelle McMurray Heath, recently spoke with experts from fashion and beauty on the I Am Bio podcast to examine the push for sustainability in fashion and how biotechnology can help the industry transform from wasteful to sustainable. We learned that pioneers at the Fashion Institute of Technology started teaching clothing reconstruction classes 10 years ago. Since that time, interest in the subject has boomed. Now, nearly 80% of the students that take the classes are pursuing a sustainable design certificate. To go from four seasons of pushing out fashion to 52 because of fast fashion, designers must figure out how to produce more sustainably. Biotechnology companies are creating new ways to stop waste from happening. Lanza Tech, a bio member company, has pioneered technology to turn gases into ethanol, commonly used in perfumes. Beyond a recent partnership with a multinational beauty giant, Lanza Tech is looking even further ahead to a journey of making everything from recycled products. To sum it up, a new approach to manufacturing will help rebuild our economies and workforce in a way that addresses climate change and enhances human health. The advancement of the bio-based economy can revolutionize, revolutionize industries by creating a value chain of sustainable manufacturing that uses biological processes to convert renewable, low-cost, or waste feedstocks into everyday products. A central component of the bio-based economy is the development of renewable chemicals to replace ingredients derived from fossil fuels. And supportive policy will help reduce environmental impacts from manufacturing by driving investment and consumption of renewable chemicals and bio-based products. Again, I appreciate the opportunity to speak on this roundtable. Thank you. Hello, I am Jorge Soto, the Sustainable Development Director of Braskem. Thank you for the invitation, and I'm here to discuss with you the challenges and opportunities for biopolymers and biochemicals in what we call the carbon neutral circular economy. First, a couple of words about Braskem. We are the largest biopolymer producer of the world and the largest plastic resin producer of the Americas. We have about 40 facilities in Brazil, USA, and Germany. We have also some offices uh, around the world and some uh, innovation centers um, in some countries in the place that we operate. We uh, were established in 2002. And back in 2009, we defined it to have our first long-term improvement cycle in sustainability. In that time, we decided to have 10 what we call macro objectives covering different aspects of sustainability like health and safety, economic financial result, post-consumption of plastic, renewable resources, etc. 
and uh, and this first uh, long term survey was from 2009 to 2020. I'm very happy to say that 85% uh, of our ambitions were achieved, and especially in the production of uh, biopolymers, we achieved 200,000 uh, ketones uh, per year. This is totally related with our discussion today. But we know that uh, there is much more to be done. Uh, we are following the threats of uh, climate change, the problems of uh, waste management of plastics, in general waste management, specifically for plastics, uh, the request for dealing with the human rights uh, in many different countries um, in a better way, also, in general, we are seeing that uh, there are a lot of pressure from the society to us to improve and ask the society, the business side, everyone to improve uh, the sustainability around the world and then those uh, main points were established in the 2030 agenda of UN. So we are aware of that. So we decided to have um, a strong policy uh, to deliver our contribution for the sustainability, having in mind a business purpose uh, that is uh, to improve people's lives by creating sustainable solutions through chemicals and plastics and working in three pillars. And I would like to highlight to you the second one that is about to deliver and develop an increasingly sustainable portfolio of products and and services. So these uh, were the biochemicals and, and bioplastics and biopolymers play an important role. As I mentioned, it, there are a lot of challenges um, and we have concluded our first long-term cycle. So we last year we started our second long-term cycle and defined a new set of macro objectives to be achieved in 2025, 2030, 2040, and 2050. Those, uh, uh, these seven um, macro objectives covered the environmental, and the social, the governance, and the economic dimensions. And, and I would like to highlight two of you, uh, two of that them to you, plastic waste and climate change. Because these two are totally related to our main uh, deliverables that we have committed. Our commitments are, um, I would say, consolidated in what we call the carbon neutral circular economy. By 2025, uh, we would like to expand our uh, green products portfolio that includes the sales of uh, 300,000 tons of uh, products with recycled content. And in by 2030, 1 million tons of that kind of product. And in climate change issue, we committed to reduce our uh, carbon emissions in our facilities in 15% by 2030 and to achieve uh, carbon neutrality by 2050. This is uh, really a commitment that is uh, saying to everyone that Braskin is moving from a linear to a circular economy. Uh, well, our first step were to include the renewables in our uh, portfolio uh, about 10 years ago. And, and with that, we are beginning the movement through a uh, circular economy process, considering the first steps of our products or production or production uh, uh, cycle. And now we are moving and including the mechanical and the chemical recycling in our uh, processes in, in order to close the cycle with the last part. And with that, we include in this uh, uh, in beginning in the end, uh, a strong message that we are moving to that uh, linear, from linear to circular economy. Of course, we will not do this alone. There are a lot of other uh, players but uh, in, you see here that we are uh, operating in this uh, process already. And we are uh, saying to the world that we will move forward in this direction. How will we get there? 
So on climate change, we have three pillars. And one of them is very important to this discussion. It's about the technology development and the production of uh, chemicals and polymers that use uh, renewable resource. This kind of approach uh, is important because we see that uh, the products that use renewable resource could uh, capture CO2 from the atmosphere if they are well managed through the life cycle. And we, when we include mechanical recycled and chemical recycled, or some people call that uh, advanced recycling, we are making sure that this uh, life cycle is well managed. Being specific on um, polymers, biopolymers, uh, perhaps some of you already know that we uh, invested in our first facility in 2010, and it was the startups of our ethylene, uh, renewable ethylene uh, facility in the south of Brazil with 290 million US dollars. And since then, we have developed other products uh, like uh, linear low density polyethylene. Uh, high density polyethylene, EVA. So these kind of products are, are already in the market. Uh, we're selling this kind of product everywhere. And because of that, we have um, um, decided and, and announced this year that we will spend our production capacity of biopolymers by 60 ketones a, a year uh, with 61 million of do US dollars of investment. But it's not only that, we believe and we trust that um, the bio uh, source strategy is very important uh, to our contribution uh, for uh, sustainability and climate change. So we, have, we are investing in new uh, products development. This is one example. Our um, uh, Biomag uh, demo plant is already in place in, in Copenhagen. Uh, this uh, will help us to uh, deliver monetylene glycol and monopropylene glycol coming from sugarcane and also from any sugar, but it's, it's specifically in Brazil, it will be wish from sugarcane. And the, with this kind of new products, we are bringing new solutions for the climate change because this uh, is also using renewable resource. But there are also challenges in opportunities and also uh, in, our, in this kind of strategy. These uh, challenges and opportunities are inherently connected to the biosource that is used. For example, here we use uh, sugar cane. And uh, in the process of the sugar cane, uh, there are uh, energy production, uh, sugar uh, uh, molas, uh, the ethanol production. There are different steps that should be considered in the life cycle of the uh, sugar cane or ethanol production or green ethylene production or the green polyethylene production. So if we consider all these steps, we'll see that the carbon footprint uh, is in interesting to, to analyze the contribution that the biocide brings to the, to the life cycle. So here you see there are some steps that bring an important contribution on reducing or, or sequestering emissions like the sugarcane production or the land use change or the, the co-product uh, electricity especially also the, the CO2, the carbon that is incorporated in the product. So they are uh, important uh, uh, contributions for the, from the agricultural side to this, uh, uh, to this product. Uh, to, to arrive to the conclusion that the, this product could capture three tons of CO2 per ton of product. This uh, kind of analysis uh, we have done with deep external verifications. Uh, there, but there are some people that could say that it could have different capture uh, value and uh, depends on the steps that uh, they consider out of the cycle. So for example, here, if you don't consider the land use change in the CO2 fixation in the products, the number will be different. So, but this, is, this will be always an important uh, aspect to be discussed. But anyhow, you see here that this kind of um, approach is bringing better carbon footprint than the fossil fuel based approach. But we see that there are a lot of opportunities to improve this cycle. Uh, here is the actual uh, today number, but uh, you could have uh, uh, more opportunities if you use regenerative agriculture or other best practices in order to incorporate 
more carbon into the soil, more carbon uh, and more good uh, best practices on the agriculture side could bring different and better numbers. So there are opportunities also in this place. So to conclude uh, this uh, uh, discussion and, and uh, this, uh, I think that it's important you to see that uh, we in Braskin are seeing that we should move and we are moving through a new economy that we are calling carbon neutral circular economy. We uh, have the courage to do that and invest in innovation. Uh, we are, uh, of course, counting a lot on the bio that uh, polymers and biochemicals, as I mentioned it, in a way to generate value for the company, but also for the whole society. And I'm sure that we are building and helping this movement for the bio future. And today we are already doing that. So thank you for your attention. And I'll be very happy to um, uh, discuss with you in any time. Thank you for that. Hi, my name is Luc van der Wielen. I'm a professor in biochemical engineering at the Delft University of Technology and the director of the Bernal Institute at the University of Limerick. And with my colleagues, shown here at the title slide, we want to discuss under the title Bio to Energy or Energy to Bio, the role of bio-based economy in a renewables world. Northwestern Europe is one of the most prosperous regions in the world. Significant contributors are manufacturing industries for materials, chemicals, food and feed, enabled by significant logistics for air, marine and long-haul road transport and increasingly also data transport. GDP per capita shown here are somewhat dated. Current numbers significantly exceed 40,000 euros per head. These panels show how relative scales of the physical transport networks of goods, top left in millions of tons per year, Stationary carbon emissions with peaks indicating main industry zones, the top right, and job density with red for high and blue for low, how they relate. Data transport and storage in data centers is exponentially growing, expecting to hit the 20% mark of global power before the year 2030. The sustainability of this economic situation is therefore of a central concern in post-academic EU, where the scale of materials and energy resources is difficult to grasp. The energy flow diagram, import and exports from left to right and domestic use top to bottom for the specific case of the Netherlands, also as industry hub and trading country is alarming, with combined imports of 110 million tons of crude oil per annum and natural gas extraction being four times larger than domestic needs that dwarf all available renewables. Biobased resources in the Netherlands amount to around 50 million tons per year, which are already purpose for food and feed and consumer products. For construction, 5 million tons of wood with the ambition to double and a modest bioenergy fraction. As a reference, the Netherlands produces on its busy footprint around 1 million tons of beet sugar, 1 million tons of wood and 10 million tons of potatoes. A recent and very optimistic inventory indicates an additional potential of 10 million tons of domestic production, which is less than 10% of current oil imports. Leading the Bernal Institute in Limerick, in Ireland, I'm at 5 kilometers of the earliest electricity project in Ireland which is the 9029 hydropower plant in Arnakrusha. Once transforming the country to meet 100% of the 1929 power needs, economic growth has led to a 40-fold increase of power needs of Ireland, much of which is met by gas and coal-fired plants. In that framework, the announcement in April of an offshore wind farm of 1.4 gigawatts seems a massive step in the right direction. These offshore and also land-based wind farms have also been realized in the Netherlands with approximately the double capacity installed, around 2.5 gigawatts at this moment. But comparing these numbers to the industry, domestic, transport and growing data requirements 
shows the alarming situation for all these sectors. Houston, or better, Amsterdam, and they, where our government is, we have a problem. We need to radically rethink how we transform to a more sustainable society. And in the context of this conference, what the role of bioeconomy, bioenergy and bio-based resources really is. My background is in biochemical engineering. So the way that I perceive the world can be expressed in this triangular diagram of carbon, C, oxygen, O and hydrogen H. Fossil resources are mostly composed of carbon and hydrogen. It gives them a high energy content. That is beneficial for use as fuels, which has a global need of around 2,000 million tons, 2 billion tons per annum. But for use as materials such as plastics, at 280 million tons per year, uh, examples given are polyethylene and polypropylene, that is not functional. For instance, for construction materials it is even problematic. A kilogram of polystyrene isolation, PS, that material has the same energy density as diesel. End of life, they degrade to carbon dioxide, which has no or hardly economic value and is the root cause of our climate problem. I also indicated the scale of concrete, which is 2 billion tons per year, as a key construction material. And all are labeled black as significant carbon emitters. Biomass in general sits in the middle of this diagram due to its higher oxygen content. That is still true for derivative products such as sugars, gasified biomass as syngas and fermentation products such as ethanol. For countries with a large agroforestry footprint that can partially green the transport and the chemical sector, although there are remaining emissions, which is why I indicated those with orange instead of black. Although wood certainly contributes to construction materials, bio-based solutions are still hardly replacing cement. And we also need to consider greenification of the agro sector, where especially animal-based protein production in meat and dairy is contributing up to 30% of many countries with massive agricultural sectors, such as Brazil, Ireland and the Netherlands. I show here the carbon emissions for Ireland, but the conference participants are invited to explore those of their home countries themselves. So we need drastic transformation including aggressive carbon reduction for all indicated sectors, but in such a manner that it improves the economy by diversification, such that it leads to high quality jobs while ensuring responsible care for nature and biodiversity. So in our view, the role of bioeconomy should be seen completely integrated with other renewables and circularity of materials, especially carbon and nitrogen. As a concrete example, we initiated a student design project as part of our regular biochemical engineering design projects in Delft. Here we explore the integration option between fermentative protein production with regional city heating networks. At the first glance, a plant, a protein production plant, producing 100 to 150 kilotons of food or feed protein per annum, which is about 5% of the Dutch food related market, has a metabolic heat production that equals the requirement of a mid-sized Dutch city of around 100,000 inhabitants. The nitrogen demand is thought to be delivered from wind power from any of the wind energy connected industry hubs in the Netherlands. The carbon could come from available sources, which could be municipal waste, cement, steel or biomass. But the devil, or God, is in the detail so the project targets a full-blown techno-economic and environmental scenario analysis. Another bio-based innovation is the mimicking of the natural process of the sandstone formation. Sandstone is composed of sand bound together by carbonates. These carbonates originate from metabolic activity of microbial soil life and are in natural structures constrained by mass transfer of carbon and the nutrients. When these limitations are taken away, technically for instance by injection, the process can be accelerated from multiple centuries into days. Technically, carbonates can be stored here while adding value, as opposed to regular 
carbon capture and storage processes in empty gas fields. Further technology development and large-scale application can provide a game-changer in the construction sector. With this type of bio-based and circular innovations, we should look completely different at our CHO triangle that can be driven by solar, wind and bioenergy and by carbon from a multitude of available circular sources. Obviously, techno-economic analysis of the micro, say business scale, or macro, regional or country scale should be done to discriminate between sense and nonsense. And now also the title from the lecture may become clear. In a circular and biorenewables world, cycles need to be driven by renewable energy and circular materials. Renewable energy may actually drive bio-based opportunities, and bio-based opportunities enable the creation of economic value to renewable energy. This implies that we need to rethink the linear biorefinery model in a much more circular environment that optimizes economic value created and reduces overall emission footprints. In our previous work, we started to dig deeper in the technical and economic feasibility of biorefineries over 20 years ago. Benchmarking state-of-the-art specific requirements for the emerging biorefineries has helped to guide the industrial development of the large last quarter century. A typical and detailed example of these studies, among many others, is shown here. This has led to a productive range of scenario studies and outlooks around multi-product biorefineries, feedstock product technology combinations and logistic situations. As a matter of fact, scanning through earlier research work in the 1990s, we were working then through cost and emission reduction of food and feed related proteins, targeting manufacturing cost in cents per kilo while reducing carbon and energy footprints below the then industry benchmark. All of this is becoming much more relevant in the context which we discussed today. We don't have time here, but this thinking needs to be seen in the context of integrated bioprocesses. Recently, we published a paper in which we emphasized that in the context of such sustainable development, minimization of operational expenditures, or OPEX, plays a critical role in many cases at the expense of increased capital or capex expenditures. And it also emphasized that a full systems analysis is required, because where individual aspects make sense, the integral picture may still be unfeasible, as the Dutch artist Escher has visualized in this watermill picture. Investment decisions around these complex scenarios is not by techno-economic analysis only, but needs to be considered in the actual regional environment of its potential implementation. This diagram shows the interactions between technical decisions and economic impact, as well as a number of societal impacts that relate to location. Assuming this represents the future landscape of bio-based and circular manufacturing, these topics should enter our academic and training programs. While deep science and robust engineering are very much required, innovative solutions should match the complexity of the landscape, the legal and financial context, as well as their public acceptance and cultural fit. The two publications referenced here, those interactions. In conclusion, we need to develop a robust framework for integrating and evaluating bio-based solutions in a fast developing landscape of other renewables and circularity. That framework, or checklist, needs the following aspects. What is the pivotal role of bio-based in sustainable food and feed, materials and energy in a landscape that is tuned to other renewables? Economic and climate targets, optimize yields, feedstock, energy utilization and potentially the overall redox balance. A techno-economic analysis early to guide development such as, for instance, in this country, Bonomi's virtual biorefinery. Process structure, driving forces, uh, need optimization, which is not maximization of the single force, but the overall scheme, not really discussed here. 
a multi-product aspects, a multi-site hub, pre-processing, logistics, and so on. This is the objective of joint projects of Delft University of Technology, University of Limerick, and the Unicamp team. We target specific projects in sustainable aviation fuels and proteins and carbonates manufacturing, which we plan to report in a future contribution. Thank you.